Joe Rogan recently came to Austin, Texas, and I took the opportunity to go see my old friend. And of the dozens and dozens of interviews I've done with Joe, this one is hands down the best. So here it is, my backstage interview with Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan, my old friend. Here you are in Austin at the W, at the Moody, big packed house. You're about to go out there in 15 minutes. To you, what is the nature of reality in your core spirit, whatever you want to call it? What is the nature of being on this planet in deep space, orbiting the sun, this, this magic all around us? And we're busy worrying about how many liters of vodka Lindsay Lohan had. First of all, give me a hug, you big, beautiful bastard. <laughs> You're awesome, man. Good, good to see, see you. you. Man. I good miss to you. See you. So good to see I you miss you too, year. man. Yeah, we see each other once a year. And uh, I think you're one of the most misunderstood people on the planet. And uh, I'm, I'm glad we're friends, and I'm, I'm glad we've been friends for so long. You're an interesting dude, Alex, and you're, uh, you're a real truth seeker, you know? There's a lot of people that, uh, that, that don't appreciate you for what you do, and appreciate, like, a lot of people don't get to know you. Like, you're a fucking cool guy. You're a really nice guy to hang around. We've taken Alex to the UFC before. We've done so many comedy shows with you at Cap City and hung out with you. You're a good dude, man. At its core, I was thinking about this yesterday. What I do, what you do, what a few others do, I think it's that we are real, and that's what people are so desperate for. Yeah, right or wrong, I'm, I'm real as I can be. If I'm wrong, I'm sorry. I didn't think I was wrong. I, I'll, I'll tell you if I'm wrong. But um, I'm going to be as honest about this whole thing as I possibly can. And I think we owe each other that. And I think the idea that we don't and that we shouldn't think that deeply or we shouldn't uncover problems and issues and we should just go about our lives, ooh, I don't think that makes sense. I don't think that makes sense mathematically. It doesn't make sense logically. I think we, as a species, owe it to ourselves to be honest with ourselves. That's the best benefit that we get from being around other people is to understand the, the, the real information as they see it. And you can process that any way you like. You can look at it and put it through the filter of ego and personal circumstance and all sorts of things that make people have opinions that are biased in one way or another, whether it's a liberal or a Republican. But when you get past all that, if you, you, you really get to see how a person is thinking when they're honest. And when they're not, you, you don't really know who you're talking to. You, you're, you're dealing in this fantasy world of You're dealing in this world where someone's pretending to be something because it looks like that looks best on the numbers. You know, like they've looked at like some sheets and say they prefer uh, Christian, uh, nothing Mormon or anything crazy like that. This is what people prefer, so let's go Christian. Uh, they prefer a person wears a tie and a suit all the time, so let's dress in the appropriate manner. And they sort of slowly but surely segment themselves into this ridiculous population of pretenders. So a world of people in entropy making the quote safe bet, but then when everybody does that, the Titanic basically goes down. I don't think you can have a safe bet anymore. I think it's fake, and I think that way of talking is annoying to people, and I think we've only accepted it because we've had to. And I think now that it's 2012 and we have the kind of access to information, this raw, the raw information, not sanctioned by CNN or sanctioned by Fox News or it, the, the raw shit. you get it from people on cell phones in Bahrain and all, you, you're, the you're, era of, yeah. of the gatekeepers over? I think it, the, that, that model doesn't work with the access to information that we have today. Everybody says mainline television and media is dead, but I heard you say it 15 years ago, before I even met you a year or so later, when you came to visit Austin. I mean, how, how did you see it so far out? Well, it, was a, it, was a, it wasn't just me, man. It was like that song, that Don Henley song. Is it Don Henley or Glenn Fry? Who has that song? Dirty Laundry? Oh, yeah. It's not an Eagle song, is it? Who is no, it? No, I think that's... Uh, I think that's the first guy. Yeah, Don Kick Henley. Kick them all right? up. Yeah, down. it's Don Henley, right? Is that yeah. who? Anyway, the guys from the Eagles. That <laughs> dirty laundry song, man. That's that was in like the '80s or something, yes. wasn't it? With well, the beautiful song, but it's so it's so just right. It's a show. The pr the problem with making the news a show is you 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 know like I was watching this Fox News thing. We were just talking about it where 
the Fox News people had to like laugh and joke about uh, being upset about Obama losing. They were like, huh, you know, maybe we, can they ask them if they would take Obama with them as well? <laughs> I don't think they would do that. <laughs> so it's like this like really joke, but it's re really what it is, is like this sanctioned opinion that we're upset that we lost, that we're really, we're, you know, it's almost like you're ragging on a, a rival football team. It's like WWF wrestling, it's yeah, all fake. It's, so shifting outside of that, you talk a lot about the nature of reality. The nature of reality, Joe, what is it at your core when you wake up at 4 a.m. in a hot sweat? What do you see out there? See, that's that's the thing. There's no answer to that. It's too confusing. The, the, you you would t you could take a position if you wanted to, but there's no real answer to it. We're a manifestation of the consciousness of the universe. W what we are is what we are, and I don't understand it. And to try to box it up and, w and either limit it or uh, be. Uh, over indulgent in my appreciation of it or whatever whatever it is it is and there's some real rules to this thing whatever the hell it is and one of them that seems to make sense is that you got to be nice to people and you got to enjoy this thing and you got to spread as much fun and happiness as you can and if you can do that you're like a generator of happy feelings and people want to feel happy like you, you literally g can generate like a whole a whirlwind of happy feelings. You can you make happy communities. You can make happy connections between other people. And one of the best ways of doing it is to give them your real feelings about things and to give them, you know, stand up comedy and to give them podcasts. So, what the universe wants is. Reality. Well, this is my reality. This is all I can comment on, the, and uh, my own physical, your personal reality, reality instead of somebody else's, and that's the key. Well, uh, you can get defined easily by other people's perceptions of you. My my whole life, I was convinced when I was a young man. I was convinced I was a loser, absolutely convinced. Until I started getting really good at martial arts, I never thought I was good at anything. I just had a, a very low self-esteem. And I was limiting myself by what I thought were other people's opinions of me. Um, this is when I was a really young kid. And I didn't figure this out until I was like in my 30s. But I think that you, you absolutely can be limited by your perceptions of someone's definitions of you. But you can break through that stuff that is, that's what you break through with discipline. You, that's where you break through with hard work and concentration and focus. And that's why it's so important to have like either a discipline or an art or something that you're trying to create or something that you're really focusing on. Because if you don't have like a point of focus as a human, I think it's very hard to get through this life and have an appreciation for, for true struggle. Because our physical struggle with what our bodies are designed for, the caveman, of 10,000 plus years ago, our bodies are still designed for that. That physical struggle doesn't really manifest itself when you're sitting in front of a cubicle, you know, in front of a computer in a cubicle uh, in this unnatural position all day. I think the whole, the whole situation is very confusing for the human body and we don't get the tests that we need in order to have what you would call personal sovereignty. So you gotta impose those tests on yourself. Just be real, yeah. and that's all you can do. That is all you can do. But my, my, my confidence is not real. Like, I'm not a confident person. I'm, I'm an honest person, but I, I'm as terrified about possibilities as anybody. I mean, anybody who's ever seen me, like, look at videos of animal attacks and, and see how I cringe and I am terrified of animals. You know, I see like wild animal attacks and I hear about like that little baby that got dropped in the zoo in Philadelphia Eat recently. Dogs. You know, but I hear about that. You're tied to your original Woo! Dude, animals scare the fuck out of me. They scare the fuck out of me. So I'm, I'm not like a confident person. I'm an honest person. But uh, I think honesty is confidence. But I, I think our, a lot of our issues are social. And a lot of our issues, when you deal with confidence, it's a lot of it is the way people are with each other. And I think we don't understand when we're doing it that we're limiting people. 
but that you can you can really limit a person's potential by defining it for them at a young age. And that's what the system does. They dumb everybody down. They try to limit yeah. the potential. And for me, that it seems to be a human thing, though. It doesn't seem to be just a system. It seems to be almost just a human weakness, a, a lack of character, and a lack of someone explaining to them or them experiencing where true happiness comes from, which is, you know, it sounds like really hippie, but true happiness comes from making other people happy. True happiness comes from being around happy people and enjoying each other's company. That and that's Yeah, that's really hard for people to wrap their heads around because they always associate true happiness, no, true happiness is with like titles, you know, or you know numbers, or you know objects that you possess, or whatever it is. How high you sit on the bird? bird. Yeah. Let me ask you this question then: Looking at this and where the whole world is going, what does your gut tell you about the future of humanity? You know, there's a lot of people who are pessimistic, and I, I'd say that that the, 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 that's your own choice. Like you could look at all the possibilities that could happen to us just naturally and really be terrified every day you got out of bed. If you stopped and thought about asteroids and super volcanoes and f shifting of the polar ice caps and new ice age and Jesus Christ, you could, you, could, you could go into a coma just sitting and thinking of the possibilities of natural sh that can kill you. Earthquakes and hurricanes and tornadoes and tsunamis and it never ends it never ends literally poison spiders what the f there's so many different ways you could die and i think that uh, we 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 have to we have to be able to address that as human beings at your gut level joe what do you think about the bin laden raid right? <sighs> i don't know you know first of all i think that being a position that I think whenever you talk about any any intense military operation like that, those guys, those those Navy SEALs that did that, those Navy SEALs? Yes. Those are some of the baddest <laughs> on the planet. I mean, I, I have a lot of respect for someone's ability, fortitude, character, discipline, the type of discipline involved in being a Navy SEAL. I have a, a tremendous amount of respect for those type of human beings. But what I, what I don't necessarily trust is the people that make the decisions that put these guys into certain positions. It's them that I, I trust implicitly. Like, I, I, I understand the kind of discipline that it takes to be elite at anything. And when you're in an, in an elite at something as life or death, as being a Navy SEAL, you're a bad <laughs> period. So I don't ever want to say anything that's disrespectful to anybody that's in that position. Because I, I, I respect their intentions 100%. But it sounds like a silly story. Like everybody says this guy's been dead for a long time. They said that Bin Laden, I mean, I, I, I see all these different people who've said that Bin Laden had already been dead. I don't know. I wasn't there. I have no information other than some that I read in the newspaper or watch on TV. But the official stories turn out to not be true. And I, I well, talk it, to a it Navy It seems SEAL. like they lie about everything. We ready to do this? Seven? What? So seven, seven minutes? minutes. Good. Here we go. I actually, seven minutes. I, I actually talked. I'm not going to get the whole story. Mm -hmm. but a, a guy is a Navy SEAL. Been to his house. He texted him. Yeah. Turned out, well, I'm going to give too much away. My family knows him. He's not in SEAL Team 6, but his buddies only on the few that lived. Uh-huh. The hell, they blew up a helicopter that night. They went... In, killed the target, brought it out, blew the helicopter up, told the SEALs that was Bin Laden, the helicopters that got away, and then the other SEALs got mad and they blew up. Remember the SEALs? SEAL uh -huh. Team 6, the helicopter blew up a month later. And the SEALs said... So wait a minute, you're saying SEALs attacked other SEALs? No, 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 no. What I'm saying is, they send a bunch of helicopters. They right, go right. in to kill a target. Right. They're told, get this target, it's Bin right. Laden. Right. They bring Bin Laden's body onto the helicopter, it blew up. Right. They blew it up. Then the rest of the SEAL Team 6 complained about it, and most of them died and blew up. They killed most people on the raid. Oh. Remember a month later, the SEAL helicopter? Yeah, I six? thought that was just another un, uh, unrelated incident that was uh, no, just they, they, no, they part blew. of like what you, they're doing over there is incredibly dangerous. No, it is, but they blew, But that was the biggest loss in, in the entire Afghan war. Up to that right, point. but that is, is, I mean, is there a real connection between those two events? I talked to the SEAL, and he said, we believe Al-Qaeda put a bomb on the plane, on the helicopter, or the or the government did it. Right. But it could have been that they just got shot down too, right? Is that possible? Well, they, they said they never I mean, they're in 
war. I know, but they never, but that was the biggest loss of SEALs the yeah, entire war. Yeah, but sometimes that, that's how shit goes down. Remember that Scud missile that landed on that, uh, the, the barracks in the first Iraq yes. war? There was like no deaths up until that, very few deaths. And then this one Scud missile got through and killed a bunch of people. And then that was that one big event. I mean, no, no, big events been, do happen. Could have been true. You're absolutely right. Uh, but I mean, my whole point is the, the, the fake Situation Room photo. They later right. that was fake. The burying at sea. Well, yeah, it seems like a silly story. But the problem is, they've. This is the real problem. The only reason why I should even be saying something like this. The only reason why you should qualify when you say something like that. Like it seems like a silly story. No, I understand. But, he, but this is this is my my reason for saying this. I saw the Jessica Lynch story, which was the, the the girl who was injured in the Iraq war. They said that they had to go in and rescue her and there was a gunfight and they she they rescued her and she said that, that no, no such thing ever happened. And she got in a lot of trouble and was, t took a lot of heat by refuting the, the, the official statement. They tried to manufacture a narrative about to her life. To get women in the life. military. What about Pat Tillman? Yes, Turned exactly. Uh, that's two things. Well, Pat Tillman, the bottom line is, wh whatever happened with him, he was killed by friendly fire. Now, that's not what was in the initial report. The initial reports of his death were that he had died in defending his country. And the coroner wouldn't lie and said it was homicide. Well, well I mean, was it homicide or was it friendly fire? I think there's a lot of f confusion when you're in a war. Well, they shot him in a distance, then he begged for his life. They came up and triple tapped him around the forehead. But how do you know that, though? If you weren't, but if you weren't the there, coroner's report. Yeah, but see, man, how do you? How, unless you were there, unless you saw how it happened, the coroner's report is going to show he got no, shot. No, 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 I hear you. It's just when you have a history. Of, Pat was sending letters back to his family, said, "I'm going to go public on the war on drugs. This whole thing's a fraud. Mm -hmm. It's a lie." And then he magically dies. And I've just learned how their mo works. But no, no, I hear you. But it is. But your what your possibility? What you're saying is po that is that's in the game too. It's possible. Well, I even talked to his brother. And, and, and I see his brother's hardcore, man. I saw his brother at a re reading at his funeral where he was talking about how Pat didn't believe in God and Pat's dead, you know, and it was like, it was really intense. It was really intense. And his story is a strange one. I mean, it's a guy who, you know, this square-jawed, uber-handsome, super-powerful athlete who decides he was going to defend his country like that football was secondary in his mind. I mean, he was a real patriot. I mean, this is a guy who really abandoned this multi-million dollar lucrative career as a professional athlete to go and defend his country. I mean, that is a powerful human being and that was cannot be denied. Saw it was a fraud, was going to come back and speak yeah, out. Yeah, and, and was strong enough to realize that he had been duped and didn't, you know, look, he's a dangerous guy to have against you. And I think that the system, you know, doesn't like people like that. And does that mean that he was murdered? No, because I think war is hell, and I think horrible things happen in war, and I think it's very possible that I he could agree. have accidentally gotten Joe, killed by Joe, you gotta go fire. out in three minutes, so let's just get this question. Three minutes, ladies and gentlemen, before the New World Order shuts this place down. Exactly, no, your fans are gonna demand it. Obama, we talked okay. about Obama deception, you called it. Not that we're saying Romney's good either, but the point is, yeah, with I Obama, NDAA, three times the pot raids of Bush, I mean, what do you say about Obama in four years not facing re-election and the power of the pardon? Look at that camera, Joe. I think it's really f***ing hard to be the president of the United States. I think that the what, our layman's view of that position is probably so woefully inadequate in really getting a feel for the, the magnitude of the pressure that guy must face from all sorts of different positions. And I think that, uh, I think I have to go on stage. Come on, I'm following you. I'll get after with him. Yeah. We ready to rock? Wait, it's quarter past. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, Brian. Look, you got, you panicked. He panicked, Brian. Yeah, See that? Hey! Stand by. You ready? You ready? Are you ready for it? <coughs> music. Yeah. You got a. What's that? You're doing your dolphin bit. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot about that. Thanks. You gotta go on stage, Brian, and show some people like this. No, that, was this mic gonna be live? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> uh, ready? Yeah, yeah, let's do it.
First of all, I want to apologize for that fucking terrible song that was just playing. Holy sh**. We're in Austin, mother Texas. You can't play me some Stevie Ray Vaughan, you dirty b Don't tell me you love me. Shut the fuck up, you weak beta. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I love the fuck out of all of you. Thank you very much for coming out. I got Duncan Trussell in the fucking house, ladies and gentlemen. And before Duncan goes on stage, I'm going to bring up one of my best friends on the planet. You know him as the co-host of the Joe Rogan Experience podcast and the producer of the Death Squad Podcast Network. Give it up for my man, Mr. Brian Redman. There's an awesome crowd out there, man. That crowd is awesome. They're so fired up. So much crackling out there. Woo. What is on your mind? I mean, what do you want to say to millions of people out there watching? Well, we were just talking about this whole Obama thing, and I think that what, what, I, you know, what I said earlier is, is really important to consider. Whenever you're talking about the President of the United States, I don't think we really even have a, 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 one iota of an understanding of the pressures that guy faces. And I think if you look at him and look at like the things he's written and look at the way he speaks and his positions that he holds and the way he debates things, he seems to be a very moral man. He seems to be a very wise guy, a very intelligent man. Um, and, but I think that he is in an unbelievably difficult position. And a lot of the influences that are in politics and in, 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 in national decision making are not based on moral decisions. They're based on financial decisions. And they're, they're based on the idea that making money is equal, at least equally as important as benefiting human beings, as uh, at least as equally important as something that would have a positive impact on human beings. Like it can't be thought of that terrible things can be done, that environments can be polluted, that waste can be dumped into holes, it's toxic for hundreds of thousands of years, as long as you can make money from doing that. That, that should be able to be done. It should be some sort of a balance in between. And I say that's ridiculous. Like it's got to be thought of, it's got to be thought of from a position that anything that gets done if, if it has a negative impact on humans, if it has a negative impact on the environment, it really shouldn't be done. I agree with you, but the, the, the globalists run this eugenics operation where they say we're doing this for the good of the earth, but then they do the GMO, they do the toxic waste dumping, they do the nuclear testing yeah. while lecturing us about you know, how much carbon dioxide we exhale. In fact, I'm glad you brought that Well, it's, it's just a, it's a crazy position because we find ourselves in this system that's already been created before we were born. I mean, before you and I could ever drive, cars had always, they, they had existed for many, many years. People had been driving them. We grew up, we drove cars, that was just it. You know, I mean, the, we, we were born into this it's situation. It's like computers, they won't even know any difference. But, but what I'm saying is we were born into this situation where we were contributing this poison into the environment. And then it became, uh, this consideration of how much poison can you put in. I think we were born into this situation where, you know, we have these highways we travel to every day at work, every day you get in your car and you start it and you drive, and then one day when you're in your 20s, whatever the hell it is, you realize, whoa, I'm a part of some crazy pollution machine. Like, okay, I thought I was just driving to work. Like, I, I, I thought I was doing what people had always done before me, but now I have to consider that maybe the people that had set this path before me really didn't understand the end game, really didn't understand the true consequences of lighting gasoline on fire to propel explosion engines and driving around with it. You know, that, like, really, that's not good. You don't want to breathe that you and I are both parents, and we, we both knew each other before we were parents. We knew each other when we were single, and I think uh, having children of your own, you, you have a, a, a greater understanding of what a, a child really is. And a child, a, a human being, is just this bundle of potential. You know, I mean, how much energy does this battery have? And the, the energy can be wasted in a negative manner, or the energy can be focused in a positive manner. And 
the wrong situations in people's lives can put them in the wrong positions to make the wrong decisions which sends them further and further and further down an undesirable path until they find themselves some horrible psychological piece of and I think that at the root of that horrible psychological piece of whether it's a dictator or it's a corrupt politician or it's a you know, an evil CEO is a, a broken child. The heart of that is a person who didn't learn that your, your love for humanity should overcome your love for ones and zeros. And that the, you, sh you cannot be able to sacrifice your love for humanity for, for ones and zeros and be happy. Because you'll realize you're, you're some sort of a you're, you're like a, a cannibal on, on, on life if you do that. You're, you're a person who has gone towards this thing that doesn't even mean anything, this, this, the numbers and objects, and put it at the forefront of the most important thing in your how do you affect the universe profile. You're, you're, you're not concerned about being nice to people. You're not concerned about having a positive impact on people. You're more concerned with making ones and zeros. And when you don't that, care that about other negative, people, doesn't it really say you don't care about yourself? It does. And see, we're not taught that. It's, it sounds like hippie bullshit, but it really truly is how the human race interacts with each other. You, you really have to be nice to other people to be happy. You have to. If you're not, you won't be happy. And, you know, we all make mistakes and we all find ourselves in positions of frustration and we've all acted out and yelled at our dog when maybe we shouldn't have. And, you know, there's all there's pressures in this life. But I think it's really important to recognize what, what those truly are and to understand that at the end of it, we can alleviate a lot of how we deal with in this life. If we really treated people the way we would treat them as if they were ourselves living another life. 92% of nuclear reactors are leaking. They're building more. 20 years ago, they cared about having problems. Now they've just raised the level of radiation, in some cases, a thousand times on the isotopes at Fukushima. The government knew the tuna had high radiation hit in California. They still fed it to people. In 1990, they wouldn't let troops use DU because they knew in the studies it killed them. After 1990, they just said it's fine for you to use. There is a self-destructiveness, because these scientists all talk about talking to other scientists, and they go, oh, humans won't be here in 50 years anyways. So what? Let's just do it. There's almost like a, a, a self-destruction switch that's been flipped. So some groups are flipping the self-destruct switch. Others are trying to transcend and say, hey, we, let's not do this. What do you say about just, just these two rushing rails in, in, in the world? Do you agree or... Do you disagree? Do you have something to add? Um, I think we're, we're definitely, society is in an odd position where we require certain types of, uh, of energy. We, we, we require electricity. There's, there's really no getting around running a city without electricity the way they're set up right now. And because of that, we have this deep dependence on massive amounts of power. And most people really don't want to think about where that comes from. It's a, it's a real issue. And when you have, to, you, you have to deliver power to all these different cities, you have to deliver power to all these different people, like you need some sort of a massive source. And that needs to be considered. And it's not, it's not going to be considered in, unless we understand that this nuclear power thing, although it's very efficient and it's very powerful, it is scary as f <laughs> And if it goes off the rails, it's nuts. It poisons an area for hundreds of thousands of years. You don't want to be anywhere near it. You can't go near it. You can't go there. You'll die. If you go and stand there, it'll f kill you. Like, man, are, well, is that our, our only option? Isn't it sunny out here all the time? Should be really, especially in California, shouldn't we really be experimenting with ways to cut these nuclear power plants, stop them, and like make these giant solar banks? Is that possible? And there's millions solar of acres. Solar panels don't blow up and make your kids die. Yeah, and we still don't understand what, what the effects are of those gigantic towers that are like right over some people's houses. Have you ever gotten out of someone's car or gotten out of, you know, in front of someone's house and they live near one of those places? Yeah. It's like right under those giant wire proven, tower things. Listen, when you drive under with an AM radio, 
or even XM, it cuts out. Yeah. It's so powerful. Dude. No, no, they've totally proven those. That ways. feeling is weird. I've only done it once. I was working in Boston and I was doing construction, I think. It was like when I was in my, my, my young teens. And we got out at this site and it was near one of those towers. I'm trying to piece it together in my memory without manufacturing any of it because it was a long time ago. But all I remember is, I remember for a brief moment being under one of those things going, whoa, no, you, like you cents. can feel it. Like we were close, we were fairly close to it. I forget, I, I really, it was, I was maybe like 17 years old, so I don't really remember exactly. No, you could feel it. It, you there was there was an there was a like a weird feeling in the air. Listen, if you walk in front of a microwave running, yeah. it's it's not auto, it's not real heat. But you can feel it. I mean, there's I mean, there's no. I won't even use the microwave in my house now. I've had you on many times. It was always exciting, and you were always one of the most popular guests. Hard to get, busy guy. Now it's reached like crazed level, foaming at the mouth to get you on. What the hell, zeitgeist, have you had? Um, I don't know, man. I just, uh, I just did the same thing and just kept doing it. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Uh, I think it's got to be the podcast. That's the, the most obvious and possibility. You do it just over and over again, it's real. Yeah, well, you know, and we have as many interesting people as we can, like you had uh, that John McAfee guy or McAfee, excuse me, guy, and we had, we had that guy on too. That's a, that's the type of guy that I, I want to talk to. Fascinating characters. We have a lot of authors, really uh, interesting, intelligent people. And it's not a left of, or right. It's no. not. It's just wide open discussion. Yeah, look, I'm not left or right. Um, you know, there's a lot of shit about me that's left, and there's a lot of shit about me that's right. Um, I, I, I hunt. I, I just started hunting this year. I, I killed a deer. And uh, I, I totally became a hunter. I'm like, Jesus Christ, if I could do this and get most of my meat this way, I would way rather do that than buy food from the grocery store. I, I, Quantify you, that. Yeah, well, you, first of all, you, this, we know about all the different antibiotics and different things that they pump into cows. But uh, on top of that, there's still, cows are not supposed to be eating corn. And most cows that you buy in a grocery store, they're corn-fed cows because corn-fed cows get really fat and by the way, it is delicious. I'm not knocking corn-fed beef. It's oh, some of the most fantastic Cigarettes steaks I've ever had. Oh God, I love I love steak, man. I'm a steak eating man. I I, I went to uh, Morton's the other night. I had a, a fat New York strip. Oh, I loved it. And I'm sure it was corn-fed, but. There's uh, healthier cows or grass-fed cows. Their, their bodies are <laughs> their bodies are designed to process grass, and. Um, Unfortunately, that's, that's not t told to us in school. We don't really understand that. I mean, most people don't really like delve deep into nutrition enough hunting, to find out that... Hunting, it's, it's natural. It's not that you like killing something. You're designed to go out and get it. And, it's, it, and then it's weird. When you're butchering it, it's like, wow. Yeah. I, it's like instinctive. I know how mm -hmm. to do this. I didn't necessarily feel like that because, uh, first of all, I, I, uh, I did it on a TV show. I did it on this guy's... Um, Show it's called Meat Eater. This guy Steve Ranella, and um, he uh, he's like he's not just a, a professional hunter. He's a really smart guy, and he's a, he's an author and a, 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 a just a Keep really going. You want a, beer? a historian. Get you a beer for you? I'll, yeah, I'll get it. I got I'll one get right it. here, man. Right, I got I'll one. Do you do you want a beer? That's what's going on. Um, it didn't it didn't feel natural to me, but I I had seen so many of his episodes of his show and of. Ted Nugent show. I've seen I've seen so many different deers get butchered that it seemed normal to me because I that I knew what to expect, you know. And although I never uh, butchered a deer before, I had killed a lot of fish, uh, you know. I'd, I'd done a lot of fishing when I was a kid, so um, I you know I knew that that thrill, the thrill of fishing, which is very similar in some w weird primal way to the thrill of hunting. They're very similar. Exactly, but, but people that don't hunt, they think you just want to go kill something. No, it's no. that you're in this mode of being in the woods with that bow and arrow or that rifle waiting yeah. and then picking out what you're going to shoot. I mean, it's so primal. Yeah. And, and I don't have time to hunt a lot anymore, but people that go and buy their food at the store but then demonize people How is that it? hunt, it's crazy. Brian just got off stage. Hey, Come here. Brian. Brian. That was awesome. Brian, what do you say about the... Come over by the microphone. What do you how, say about how the I mean, I don't have, know about come over, have a seat right here. We're not into celebrity Where's your mic? Right here? Right here. Yeah. But what do you make of Joe, and, and, and you as well, but just the meteoric 
rise. What do you chalk it up to? It's great because now for the first time ever, we're actually connecting with an audience that is exactly the audience that, you know, before it was like, oh, that guy from Fear Factor or that guy from UFC yeah. or, or getting your ideas out to somebody. It was always like, I saw him on TV. I think he's cool. But now it's like you listen to a podcast. My best friends don't know me as well as people that, that listen to the podcast every day. Like my, my no, no, they get to know you. They get to know me. Radio, they yeah. get the, yeah. like the biggest biography known to man. Like yeah. How many, yeah. like, because you're being honest. Episodes? You're being yeah. honest. So yeah. it's for the first time we're actually getting people that are coming to their audience to, to the shows or to whatever or that are 100%. We know everything about you. We like what you do. You know, this is not like I saw you on TV. You might be funny or not. No, these people know us. And that's the first time that's ever happened and there's ever. There's very few yeah. people that don't do. It's a podcast. It's video too, but it's basically talk radio. Right. And, and the thing is when it's not scripted, I get to where I have to tell people things that are true that are even embarrassing about me now. Because it's like it's so weird, you can feel the energy. You guys want to talk about that? Because I mean, you brought this up. Elaborate on how strength. Because few know this. Few get to talk hours a day in front of people and then learn that it becomes a real relationship. Well, yeah, it, it definitely does. And you know what else is? You, you, God damn, you learn so much from those people, man. You know, even people who are uh, who are critical, like they send you a link to correct you, like this is the real information, and you have the inaccurate information. Like, if you don't have an ego about all that, shit, if you can deal with the fact that you might be wrong, or you might there might be you might have jumped to a conclusion, there might be many possible scenarios. It's a giant thing. You tank. yeah, you learn so much from people on Twitter, man. Uh, you know, a lot of people will complain about like negative things on Twitter. I don't get that much negative on Twitter but I occasionally get like yo I'm gonna punch you in your face if I yeah. see you faggot yeah. you know but well even maybe the it might not even be grab, that like something from some of the negative stuff like even if there's like a ton of negative <sighs> usually there's like a 1% truth to it yeah that yeah, 1% yeah, yeah. will kind of stick in that back of your head where you're like all right and he took it to like the next level, but I do understand that 1% of yeah. what he's talking about. Yeah, you can get a hater who's like 90% hater, but 10% it has a point. You. It does help yes, you. I, I really know. believe it. It's a terrible feeling, that feeling when someone's hating on you, but I find it very beneficial. Yeah. Because for two reasons. One, because it's like snake venom. Because like if you yeah. get bit by a rattlesnake and you've ever been bit by a rattlesnake before, it will you up like someone who has never been famous and then all of a sudden decides to do a reality show and then they get all these insults hurled at them from every direction online that has got to be horrific that's just going to be torturous but when you take a little bit of hate venom and a little bit of hate venom then you develop an immunity to it you kind of understand what it is it becomes enjoyable well, then it becomes a checking mechanism, and I look at it almost like as if it's an algorithm. And I look at it like, well, this, this negative coming in, like how much, how much does it affect me, and how, how, how much does it affect the positivity that I put out? Like, does, is, if I dwell on it, well, then it will surely f*** me up. But if I just look at it, and if I truly look at myself to say, okay, do they have a point? And if they do have a point, if I am being a like I got a, that's a very important to to be honest about that and to look at that and to that's a really important thing about growth. Yeah, you're gonna have to edit that word out, ladies no, and gentlemen, even shut online. Down, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I think that that that's that's really hard for people to do. You know, it's really it's really hard for people to um, to to take the uh, the negatives and turn them into a positive. But when you put out ma the majority positive, like the most important thing is you got to put out. It sounds f hypocritical coming from the two guys that put out the Carlos Mencia video, but th the reality is the more negative you put out, the more negative comes back oh, at you. And it, it, you don't have to do it. I you don't have you, you don't you don't have to pump out negative. You can even when negative comes at you, you can even go well. So <laughs> sorry, you feel that way. But well, what, no, I'm I not connected to that. I actually find it entertaining when trolls attack me if there's no truth in it. But even when there's some, I mean, I it's a guilty pleasure. But I know the point you're talking about. I mean, it's almost like a feedback or almost like a, a focus group where you can see yourself clearer.
when you have something like CNN or Fox News or anything, you have a, not only do you have a, a, a news outlet, but you also have an entertainment program and you have a bureaucracy. You have a bunch of people behind the scenes. There's a bunch of people trying to influence this and influence that. There's too many cooks in the kitchen. With Brian and I, it's just Brian and I. It's real. We, yeah, we don't, we don't have to talk, you know, if Brian comes to me and says, hey, I think we should talk about this on the podcast. I go, okay, are you, are you into it? Like, what is it? What is it about it that's, that you're into? Sure. He goes, oh, this is important. This is something f***ed up about this. So and the answer is... What's interesting to us? That's what it is. No, exactly. Not everyone who wanders is lost. If, if I was to ask you, where is Joe Rogan going... Would you say I've already arrived? It's just being real. I don't think about it, man. I, I, I think that, that, that that's a big waste of time. And that uh, all I think about is am I making enough money to f support myself so I don't have to starve to death? You know, am I, am I, am I making money to like for pay all my bills? Am I not getting crazy? Because I'm a very indulgent person. I don't want to do anything stupid. Okay, that's out of the way. Everybody, the family's taken care of. What's next? What do I want to do? And then do that. And I think that is the only way to live your life. What is the greatest pleasure? I'm just lucky. Uh, look, I'm just lucky that everything that I do, I get, I can get paid for. What's the greatest pleasure to say making forty million dollars that that you can take care of your family? I don't make that much money, man. Where, where did you come up with forty million bucks, that, man? Dude, yeah, right. look, I've I gotta call numbers. my accountant. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, no hey, listen, it's it's absolutely when, being a father. It's absolutely super massively important to take care of your family. It's a very, very, very important feeling. It's certainly a motivation. I hear a lot of fighters that become dads. That becomes one of their bigger motivations. They get tougher, don't they? They do. They get more dangerous. They get more disciplined. Um, I think fa fathers, like, oftentimes, like, that takes them to the next level. It's one of the reasons why John Jones is such a bad mother. He's got two kids. You know that guy is. Uh, he's providing. That's a, that's a very important. Yeah, there's a. There's, you're gonna have. You're gonna destroy. There's a motivational aspect of children, certainly. Um, I think. Yeah, uh, I found as soon as I started having kids, before I was yeah. such a nice guy, it was over. I mean, it was just like. Yeah, you want to. You you know you're like genetically driven to provide for them. Um, but when that's taken care of, then you the other uh, ideas uh, look at your fellow man as if they're also a part of your extended family. It's fucking hard to do. It's hard to do. It's hard to do. It's hard to throw your own bullshit out the window. It's hard to. That's you know, what makes me mad. Is some woman walked out in front of me today. That in a parking lot, <laughs> and I slammed on my brakes. She slapped the hood of my car, and I'm rolling. And I said, "I'm sorry, ma'am," even though she was in the wrong. And she said, "Look at you in this big old truck." Uh, you know, you piece of garbage. And then my son was next to me. This is, wow. And I snapped at her. And I was like, I was like, well, I said, where are you from, California? Not knocking folks in California, but she goes, how do you know that? And then this woman with her runs over and gets in my face. And I'm like, look, I said I was sorry to you. You walked out in front of me. And, 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 and I've noticed that's when I... Alex Jones... You need yoga in your life. You do. And you need melatonin. some yoga. Listen, melatonin. I got to go on stage any minute now. I'm going on stage any minute now, so we got to end this fucking thing. All right, we're going to end it right here. Joe? Alex? What is the secret of the universe? There's no secret. I have no fucking answers, man. You can't ask me that. What am I, a wizard? Listen. You are a wizard. Don't be silly. Don't be a silly person. I, the, I, the, the secrets to the universe is that uh, it's a fucking secret. <laughs> the exactly. whole thing's crazy. The, the universe? Come right. on, man. That's a big question. That's a big question. Right, well, here's the final question. You 14 started the billion interview. light years. You started the interview with my last question. I, I remember meeting you like in 1998, 99, 14 years ago, whatever it was, and you were like, yeah, I know a lot of this is true, but you're going too far with that. Has not a lot of what I talked about. Listen, completely. man, I will tell you this, and I give you credit for this all the time. I, there's a lot of things that used to say back in the 90s. I thought you were crazy. You were just ahead of your time. You were way ahead of the curve. You were way ahead of the curve on a lot of shit that was just massive conspiracy theory nonsense in the 1990s. Stuff that people would say, there's no way the government would ever do something like indefinite suspension or detention rather of American civilians with no trial they would never do that completely unconstitutional boom there it is that your your video I, I, I recommend this video all the time to people 9-11 the road to tyranny yes. when you showed that the World Trade Organization in Seattle 
was clearly invaded by agent provocateurs who were most likely military people. The police you spoke saw out. their their mili the police spoke out, their the military grade shoes, the fact they weren't able to arrest these guys and they had to let them go. All that stuff that you showed of these people came into a nonviolent protest and became violent and then turned it into something that the police had to respond to. I mean it's I never even thought that that would be in the the, the menu of the, the military. I would have never believed it. And then, much uh, m many years after I met you, the uh, Freedom of Information Act documents for Operation Northwood were released. That was way after I met you. Yeah, years. Years later, and I remember, wow. I remember reading that going, like, Alex, Alex isn't crazy at all. Like, they really planned on blowing up civilian jetliners. They were going to have a drone jetliner and blame it on Cuba and get us to go to war with Cuba. They were going to do all sorts of crazy things. Like, that was really in the, in the menu for, you know, the 1960s. Like, that, I thought you were bananas with some of the stuff you were talking about. And a lot of that stuff that you were talking about has turned out to be absolutely 100% true. I got to go on stage and do comedy. Do hey, Your mother me, me out. Great job. Thank you, brother. Thank you very much. Brother. Hey, but hey, do, do, like to tell the secret? It was all in Rand Corporation documents. They admitted it. Yeah. They bragged they're doing this, Joe. That's why I freak out. I used to have this joke about the future of reality TV is that there's going to be a reality show about a cameraman on a reality show. And then it's going to be a big hit. And then people are going to go, man, I want to know who the cameraman behind the cameraman is. And then there's going to be that show. And then what's going to happen is the world's going to be filled with reality show cameramen watching each other. Exactly. And it'll be like two mirrors a facing mirror. each other. Check out JoeRogan.net and check out our podcast, The Joe Rogan Experience, or on iTunes under The Joe Rogan Experience. And check out DeskSquad.tv or uh, DeskSquad on iTunes for even more podcasts if you like what uh, Joe does. Uh, we have Kevin Pereira from Pointless and Ryan Keeley and Danny DiArmond and a bunch of funny people. So Wait a minute. Is that Joe Rogan right there? That's him. No. Right there. Him. That's him right there. Holy mackerel. Oh, my God, ladies and gentlemen. All right, Alex Jones signing off for InfoWars.com and PrisonPlanet.tv. And remember, if you're watching this transmission, you are the resistance. You know, I'm about to go on stage, I think, any second now. I hope that's you, buddy. Duncan is, this is the part where he goes, he's doing a, like a trance, he goes through a trance. It's like being possessed by a demon. So you think he may be a part of the New World Order? Is that possible? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I think you might be right. I got nothing, guys. This is it. Here we go. He's going to be in the free between the world. Austin, Texas, bitches.